Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we're here for another More Insights and Strategy Insider Podcast, where we have the top-level executives from the most relevant companies in the technology space. And today we're going to talk about what has been my favorite topic for the last six months, and that's AI. And I am joined by Dr. Thomas Anderson. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Very exciting to be here. Yeah, so excited that we can talk about AI, particularly as it's related to big picture all the way down to synopsis and what you're seeing. But what I'd love for you to do is, is we can see in the lower thirds your title, and I it gave you a little bit of an introduction, but can you talk about what you do for the for synopsis, but also talk a little bit about what synopsis does as well. You're a household name in the chip and systems industry, but not everybody knows uh, who the company is and what they do. Oh, absolutely. So Synopsys is a, is a leader in providing silicon the software solutions uh, with the world's most advanced technologies for chip design, verification, IP integration, but also for software security and quality testing. So essentially, we help our customers innovate so they can bring amazing new products to life, whether that's the latest generation of cell phones, IoT devices, self-driving cars, anything that has a chip inside, we are behind providing the silicon, the software solutions to make it happen. And I personally, so my favorite topic is also in AI, obviously, and I've been working on ML and AI strategy at Synopsys for the last, I would say, five years. And I'm very excited to be in this space as there's a lot of new and changing things coming up. Yeah, I'm really excited about AI. I am excited about your space, though. I mean, 30 years ago, uh, people who could do chips, they were all IDMs, meaning they manufactured their own stuff. The, the whole notion of disaggregation and specialization wasn't even a thing. And what I really love is how you've enabled uh, companies that aren't even looked at as classic chip makers. Uh, be able to uh, work on their designs, you know, not only of their core IP, but uh, of their SOCs, uh, all the way to to helping them in their systems. So I'm super excited uh, about this space. But hey, let's dive into, into AI. And I'd like to start high level. What are you seeing in terms of how AI is changing the way businesses do business, uh, and even you know any large enterprise like like a government is is getting value out of out of this very transformative technology. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. It's a it's a very transformative technology. It really touches every piece of our lives. I think in the consumer world, you can see things like smartphones where you take photos, you get the perfect lighting when you take your selfies. To self-driving cars, for example, in San Francisco, you can now drive with Waymo cars. I think Mercedes is uh, getting their first level three cars um, um, uh, on the road later this year. Uh, but there's also usage of AI in many other areas that you don't always think about. Things like cancer research, COVID vaccine research, climate modeling, and so on. So you can say it touches every part of our lives and you don't always see it. And in the business world, of course, also, there's many, many aspects, starting with human resources, finance, marketing, sales, R&D, where you can essentially use the power of AI to automate tasks that traditionally you would have done manually, and they could be tedious. So they could be simple human tasks uh, that, that touch aspects of your business, like your sales report or uh, your marketing lateral or writing code when you write software. This can have a significant impact on the product development, whether it's software development, hardware, or manufacturing. There's just so many opportunities that are that are still out there that we can pursue to make this uh, transformative. But let's talk about chips. I mean, I love chips. I've spent so much time in the semiconductor business. I love software too, okay? Half the research we do is on software. I'd say half of it is on infrastructure. And, and hardware. Uh, we, we, there was a phase uh, uh, for a while that, that you know, people forgot that hardware 
uh, was really, really important. You know, software is eating the world. And but I love to say, well, you know, software doesn't run on air. OK, um, and let's get that that really clear. And I think semiconductors got a lot of respect, uh, particularly around uh, the pandemic time. And as we we check out what's going on in the AI space, I mean, they are literally the picks and shovels that make all of this, all of these fancy uh, capabilities uh, real. But how are you seeing AI reflected in, in semiconductors? Yeah, it's a very good question. Semiconductor is obviously a different domain than I would say most consumer applications, right? Uh, one of the reasons is I would say the complexity of the problems is hard. Like designing a chip, for example, you need an expert versus say a mundane task of driving a car and you can think about it driving a car we're still not at level five we're level three maybe starting at level four automation and you could argue that well everybody can drive a car can everybody write software or design a chip no so obviously that's a number one it's a much harder problem um it's also and I think we'll, we'll talk more about this later. Data availability is obviously another issue because I'm not mining endless amounts of public data. I have very limited amount of data. Um, so I would say that if you look at the semiconductor industry compared to the breakthroughs that have happened in the AI space and other areas, um, like the areas that you just mentioned, like on videos, on YouTube, you get recommendations. You know, I remember when Netflix came out I, rem I remember I was amazed at how great they were at suggesting the next movie for me. I was like more than 10 years ago, but I, I remember I thought that was cool. Um, I, in the semiconductor industry, of course, our problems are harder. And therefore, I think it, it took a little bit longer to get to the point where we really see applications in AI that touch things. But we do see a significant ship, uh, shift happening in the entire chip development flow. Um, and I think there's multiple drivers of it. There's number one, Traditionally, chip development is a very, very long process. And Pat, what you said about you know chip making and how hardware is suddenly cool again, that is totally true. I think you know for the last, I would say maybe 20, 30 years, it was just a thing and you know it wasn't really visible. The software is what mattered. But now hardware matters because also the type of hardware architectures that you create to again accelerate these AI applications is extremely important. And then when you do the chip development itself, waiting 12 to 18 months to come out of the next chip and needing hundreds of people and millions of dollars to build a new chip is very labor intensive. It's very expensive. So you essentially, it, it, it screams for AI to help me, help me with automating this, help me with reuse and help me essentially build it faster and better. Yeah, and for the chip folks uh, out there, right? I mean, this results in smaller geometries, um, an easier way to handle uh, all that complexity. Uh, big trend now, chiplets, multi-die uh, type of arrangements. And, you know, quite frankly, like we've seen every other good implementation of AI, the ability to help this with the engineering uh, talent uh, shortage that we have here. So, you know, if I, I talk to probably a lot of the same chip makers you do, and, you know, the expense and verification test costs are going way up. You know, sometimes we're always just thinking, oh, getting into the bleeding edge next node, that, you know, the cost of that mass set. It, yeah, it is a lot more, folks. And the, the cost per transistor is going up too, but all of the other costs to get and lead us down that direction, um, verification and, and even test is, is skyrocketing uh, as well. So how do with those challenges in mind, how specifically is AI helping uh, to meet those challenges? Yeah, very good point. Let, let's talk a little bit more about those challenges. I think you mentioned a number of them. Um, an important one is essentially the smaller nodes, smaller geometries, and therefore the complexity. And it's funny because I think I remember when I wrote my PhD thesis um, more than 20 years ago, 
uh, every paper would start with, you know, with, with the shrinking nodes and the complexity of the design. And I was thinking back then, there was nothing compared to today. So the challenge that we're facing now are way, way harder. Um, the chips are just significantly larger. So therefore the run times, even to implement them with traditional tools are very, very hard. Um, if you think about chip design, it's often a very iterative process and you simply can't iterate that much if you have such super large designs. Uh, people are moving to multi-die, for example, right? Because uh, they need to stack chips because otherwise chips are getting too big. And again, you need solutions to essentially partition up those chips to figure out how they communicate most efficiently. So there's a lot of complexity in a nutshell. Um, and, you know, there is an engineering talent shortage. In fact, uh, there was a recent study from Boston Consulting Group that forecast a 35% shortage of talent by 2030. And we hear this from all of our customers. Everybody is, of course, pushing for highest performance, but also they want to get their chips to market quicker and with fewer people. And the other thing that I, I hear a lot is that I would say there is less experts. I oftentimes hear from our customers, they say, well, we have all these new grads and all these new people. But they don't really yeah. know how to run the tools anymore, you know? <laughs> and I, I mean, I think part of that is true. And to me, actually, this is a part where AI can help because AI can make everybody an expert. And that's one of the, one, one of the, the beauties about artificial intelligence. Yeah, I love, yeah, it was funny. I, I really disliked the word co-pilot at first uh, when I heard it, but it's actually really grown on me because that's exactly what these tools can do. I mean, we're not talking about wholesale removing people out of the loop, human in the loop, but it's getting them out of some of this drudgery that quite frankly, they, they just, you know, don't, don't want to do anymore. And I, I've seen this argument in, in desktop publishing and creative tools for years and even programmers, right? When we went from machine, uh, machine language, to um, basic or Fortran, it was, oh my gosh, the, the death of the programmer, right? And then we went to, to languages like C and C++, and it was death of the programmer. And then we went to an integrated development environment. And it, I mean, every time what the market kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we have more programmers, programmers, and programmers. And the same thing happened with creativity tools, which was, Oh my gosh, the people used to lay out and cut physical pieces of color and arrange maybe to create some advertising and then we would take a picture of it. My gosh, what's going to happen uh, to these folks, right? But essentially what we're doing is we're democratizing all of these different areas, uh, whether it's publishing, whether it's creativity. And now with, with chip design, verification, uh, and, uh, and, and, and testing. So can you d uh, dive down a little bit in, into what, what you're doing specifically uh, to help, you know, meet a lot of the challenges that, that, that you illustrated here? Oh, absolutely, Pat. Um, and, and I really like, I really like your analogy of like people that used to write maybe a simpler code. And then when, when a real programming language came out, they said, oh my God, I'm going to lose my job. I think that's, a, that's human nature. Unfortunately, you know, every time something new comes out, they say, oh, but I used to be really good at that. And now I'm, it's funny because we actually, we actually see the same traits as we're rolling out um, AI technology. So yeah. one of the things, for example, we have done is uh, we've looked at the whole iterative process and the chip design flow. So for example, when you do design optimization and you want to push for lowest power, highest performance, smallest die size, you spend a lot of time tuning essentially your chip workflow until you reach these optimal targets. And traditionally that's done by humans and they just run lots of experiments and they tune their flow and then they say, oh, I'm, I'm the expert guy. I know exactly how to operate and to squeeze out the most power. And that's actually a task you can, you can really automate very well with AI, such as reinforcement learning, um, where you can essentially uh, look at this problem space and take sample points and learn how a design behaves and optimize for, for the optimal uh, power performance and area metrics. 
and you can oftentimes, actually not oftentimes, I would say always, get a better result than a human designer would. And the same application applies to other areas. We've applied the Zet Synopsis to the full, essentially, chip design stack, so start with design implementation, those we call synthesis in place and route. The things like improving verification coverage, which is a very similar iterative process where you essentially you tune your flow until you meet your coverage targets. The things like test optimization to improve your pattern count for the tester, uh, all the way to analog design. So we have tools essentially across the entire stack. We call this synopsis.ai, but we have essentially AI tools across the entire um, design uh, chip stack that helps you uh, design, verify, test, and so on your chips. Another important aspect to the optimization and getting better results is actually the learning and the reuse aspect. So traditionally, when you have a lot of experts in your company and all their knowledge is in their head, and maybe they talk at the water cooler with, with, with their colleagues and they say, hey, I found this really nice recipe. And if you do this, and you get a better result. Now, if you think about AI algorithms, you can essentially build a learning system where all this information of how you get a better design is captured in a database. And then this information can be shared with, with other parts of the company. And it isn't just in somebody's head. Or if, say, a person leaves or retires, today the knowledge goes with him. You know, and with AI, essentially, you have this and you have it stored in a database and it can be reused. To me, that's extremely powerful because it helps you scale these type of solutions across the company. So to me, these are the two key aspects of, of using AI for chip design. And Sopsis was really doing AI before it was cool, right? I mean, we're kind of using this upswell in in interest to kind of hop on video and, and, and discuss this, but you've been doing this for very much uh, a long time. And I, I wanted to point that out to, uh, to everybody. There are the people, there are companies who are just doing it now because it's part of being cool. And there's other companies like Synopsys that saw the trend early and really honed in on, hey, how can I provide a better experience for my customers and 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 went and and executed. So we've talked a lot about uh, verifying designs. We've talked about testing uh, uh, optimization, but I want to hone in on where you're using AI to actually invent new technology. So the creation or, or the design part uh, of the flow, probably right up in the very front. How is AI being used to design chips better? Now, for, for things like generated AI to create things, though, it needs a large amount of data. And if you look at ChatGPT, it has information from pretty much everything that's publicly available. But even that information is, is old. It's I think from 2021 because building these models with all this information takes a huge amount of effort and time. Now, if you look at the semiconductor industry, of course, our world is a little different. Um, our data is highly proprietary. And of course, every customer has their own uh, data um, that, of course, they will not share. And that's all compartmentalized essentially across many different companies. And if you want to build a system that essentially can create, for example, new designs, let's say RTL, when we come to a chip design language, you need to have a lot of data to actually build a system that can do that. And you need to make sure that that data is yours. So there's no copyright violations out there. The other thing I would say that's challenging is the data needs to be, I mean, the output of the system needs to be 100% correct because I cannot afford to build a chip that then doesn't function properly because somebody said, well, sorry, it made a little mistake there and it wasn't right. So you need assurance that what you're creating is actually good, that quality is key. We've seen already that ChatGPT can actually guarantee accuracy as well. They've introduced things like uh, fine tuning with uh, reinforcement learning, that's called R RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback, where essentially a human 
gives information on whether the answer is correct or not. But I think many of you have probably read that even in ChatGPT, you may get an answer that sounds very nice and sounds very good, but it may not actually be accurate. So these are some of the challenges that I think um, apply to our domain. Uh, but it doesn't mean that um, you know it's it's uh, not possible to come up with solutions. So we we personally think there's quite a lot of opportunity in the creation, and we think that's the next big thing: creation of essentially designs, automating workflows. I think these are some of the tasks that can be done with generative AI if we overcome all the you know concerns that I that I brought up: the, the data, the amount of data, the correctness, and so on. Um, then I think that it would be an extremely viable solution to uh, to chip design as well. How are you dealing with the sharing of the data out there uh, in the industry? You know, you do serve a lot of customers. How do you fence that data off? Or how are you thinking about this right now? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. A question we get very often also from our customers. I mean, data security is absolutely key. And it's really... It was from the beginning one of the main considerations from from building AirPods. In in my dream world, I would love that everybody shares data because then in a community we become better. Um, in reality, of course, you know we have competing companies and they all want to be the best. So everybody wants to make sure that their data does not leave their side. So the the, the AI applications that we're shipping customers. They come pre-trained with some public information, for example, uh, or, or synopsis IP, for example. So we train them, for example, on synopsis IP. We may train them on things where both the customer as well as we have access to, such as ARM cores, for example. But other than that, the majority of the training actually happens at the customer site. So you, you train on the customer designs and the training data that, you know, you know, results from this training remains at the customer side and it's just as secure as any other data that they they have in their secure disk so there is nothing to worry about the unfortunate part of course is that this that this doesn't allow for any sharing right and therefore again the compartmentalization remains and um i i honestly i knew from the very beginning when we started this journey many years ago this would be a big challenge because unfortunately we cannot, I'm not Facebook or Google, where I just mine everybody's data that they give me freely, knowingly or unknowingly, or, or, or Tesla, which you can just drive your cars around and on, on the public roads and, and collect millions of miles of data. Unfortunately, our world is, is much more challenging. Um, but having said that, when you train on very specific data at the customer side, it actually works quite well. So while in an ideal world, data sharing would be would be great. Um, at the same time, I can argue that you know the solution that I provide to customer A, that they then essentially train and tune on their particular chips, um, is actually very effective because just like like you mentioned, ChatGPT, ChatGPT has all the information that's out there in the world, but I don't need all the information out there. I, I need very specific information. And you know, when I built essentially a tuned application, a customer A or customer B, I, I can I can make that happen at the customer side. So from from that perspective, I think this is something that at least we have partially overcome. Of course, in my ideal world, it would still be nice if if it was possible to create shared train models for sure. Yeah. By the way, I think that is the exact route I'm seeing that in different industries. Uh, what some people aren't aware of that when a lot of this data gets vectorized, it's it's basically vectors and you can't actually determine uh, what they are. So if you can train it on site and even move it up to the cloud, nobody in the cloud can actually e even understand what uh, all this data is. I do predict, and this is one prediction I'll make, that in with three to five years, we'll have a multi-tier model that says, hey, if, if you let um, other companies uh, share um, and you provide your data, um, you'll have a better out, uh, outcome. And and that again. And by the way, I'm not the only one who makes predictions as an industry analyst. In fact, you made a prediction this year that uh, that talks about uh, that generative AI will speed application uh, development. So 
hey, we're halfway through the year. I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Where are we? Has progress been made on one of your big uh, on one of your big big uh, proclamations? Progress is always being made, of course. So yeah, absolutely. I, I think we we uh, earlier this year, um, I think we wrote about some of the uh, the directions that this NGI is taking. Um, I think number one. We've expanded essentially our offering for optimization of complex workflows, um, like what we call synopsis that across the entire suite of offerings. But number two, um, we are pursuing many opportunities in the generative AI design space. Earlier, I talked about some of the challenges that are out there, right? Like the, the data quality, the amount of data, copyright things, um, the, uh, the need for having essentially 100% accurate solution. Um, but there is actually quite a few opportunities. So things, for example, that 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 we are we are working on is, for example, creating RTL from a natural language spec. So you can think of it as a copilot. So GitHub Copilot is a copilot for pro software development, right? Um, Java, Python, C plus plus, and so on. You can think of the same way for chip design, essentially system very law creation uh, through a copilot. I think initially this would be a system. There's, you know, still the human writes the software, but the system just auto-completes. And maybe also from existing uh, Verilog, it can, it can give you a summary of what this function is doing. So you can, you can help improve it. And ultimately, I mean, the dream would be that somebody writes a national language spec and the system implements it. I think that's a long road to get to that point, but it's absolutely doable. And then if you take it away from like the language application, they already talked about language applications because of ChatGPT, but generative AI is many more things. You can do things like images, audio, video, and so on. So when you yeah. think about that, there's of course other things like physical aspects, for, for example, floor plans, power network, chip architectures. These could all be created maybe initially through a copilot and then through natural language applications. And then the other thing, and so this is sort of the creation of the chip design. The other thing is I would call the workflow automation. And you can start with things like a knowledge base. So today you have documentation and somebody needs to read online, okay, this command does that. And then there is another database somewhere that has user experience where a user said, hey, if you encounter this problem, here's a solution to that. And people today, they essentially search it with keywords. Sounds like 1980, but uh, I think with with GPT type applications, you can think of it as a chatbot, and the chatbot knows everything about EDA workflows. And I can simply initially ask it, hey, how do I do this? How do I do that? It can ultimately create you workflows automatically. You could say, hey, I want a workflow where you implement and verify this ARM processor, and here's my specs. I mean, ultimately, that's where I think this is going to. Um, the way you interact with tools, if you think about it, um, I mean, obviously, the users of our tools are engineers, and they're used to writing things like tickle code as, as inputs, and they are used to look at log files and timing reports or congestion maps as their output. But if you think about it, this could be done much better in a more human, interactive way where maybe the system tells you, hey, I looked at your run and I think there's this and this thing you should be doing to improve it. So the, I call this essentially human machine interaction that can be much improved to make it more human like. Yeah. And then ultimately, there's another concept um, in generative AI, and these are LLM agents. So ultimately, you can combine large language models that essentially, you know, look up in your knowledge base of. Uh, or give you a suggestion based on a particular problem, you can combine this with reinforcement learning agents that then become automation of your workflow. That means you run a tool, you get a particular output, and the system will actually not just interpret the output, it will actually take an action and make your design better and ultimately solve all the problems. Because again, we often talk about things like um, highest frequency, but there's so many mundane tasks that a designer has to do. 
whether it's cleaning up timing constraints or looking at DRC violations. A lot of human tasks are spent with like these, these essentially mundane, repetitive tasks. And I think for things like that, um, things like an LLM agent could be extremely powerful to automate that. So these are the areas we're pursuing. And um, I think you can look forward to uh, more announcement from us uh, pretty soon as we are going down this route of, of essentially using generative AI for, for chip design. So Thomas, I am, first of all, I really enjoyed this conversation. And I also like that we covered so much ground. I mean, top of the funnel to how enterprises are using uh, AI, can use AI into the future, all, all the way down, you know, how do chip makers use this and designers, all the way down to what you're seeing in the future. And with a little, little tease at the end, uh, which I appreciate. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing about uh, what you are going to bring out because, again, this isn't new for you. You came out with your first um, AI-based uh, tool uh, years ago. So I can't wait to see the enhancements that uh, you're doing that to really benefit chip makers, you know, reduce time to market, reduce expense of, of test, validation, uh, and 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 design and I'm hopeful that a lot of chip makers are going to just jump jump on this. What I know for certain is there's not enough resources that we need uh, in in the chip design test and uh, validation phase, and the expenses are getting so uh, out of control, particularly on the uh, newer complex uh, design. It, these things really sound music to, to people's ears. So thanks for coming on the show, Thomas. Absolutely. Very exciting to be here. Thank you. So this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy uh, signing off. Um, what a great discussion. Uh, let us know what you thought about the video. Uh, you know where to find me on social media. I'm on it uh, way too much. But if you like the video, you should subscribe to the channel. Just hit that subscribe button uh, wherever you are on the planet. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Have a great day. Take care.